Hello and uh, welcome to lecture four of the EGM 37 additive manufacturing uh, module. Uh, this is going to be on the mechanics of a powder bed system. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about the AM250, which is an old system that we had at Swansea. We're going to look at the actual overall operation process, the powder flow route, the powder delivery from the hopper, the powder spreading, the wiper, the powder bed system itself, the laser system, the gas flow loop, the powder revert loop and powder handling. Um, and these are aspects which are uh, relatively common between the AM250 and the AM400 Renishaw systems. Uh, and it's slightly different in the new system we've had in the REN500, which has uh, an automated powder uh, uh, revert loop. One of the important things about working with powder is the health and safety. Um, so, uh, I'm, the machines do have very specialist operators who have been trained, uh, usually with these machines from Renishaw, by Renishaw themselves. Um, there's a high power laser, so you have to make sure you don't operate it with the door open. Uh, it's high voltage, obviously. Um, surfaces get hot, we're melting metals, and uh, there is a, um, a base plate warming system that goes to 200 degrees. The powder itself um, can be uh, highly carcinogenic. There are the potential for nanoparticles. You have to wear goggles. Powder getting into the eyes could damage the eyes. And of course, there are all the problems uh, respiratory and carcinogenic uh, of uh, dealing with powders. So it's, it's quite a potentially lethal environment unless it's done properly. And we have some very uh, well developed health and safety uh, for um, our machines. The hazards include toxicity, the flammability of the powders, how to handle powders if there is a fire, uh, handling the powders themselves and processing, and, how, and then how you store the powders themselves. So we have a number of safety procedures. We have a metal powder safety checklist, the uh, residual dangerous maintenance and protective measures, full PPE kit during clean downs of machine. This includes the safety during the maintenance. Uh, any work on electric equipment, we do not touch this. This gets done uh, uh, by Renishaw engineers. And then, of course, we have to be careful um, when handling hot, um, potentially hot surfaces. So this is the old AM250. Um, so from the outside, it's a box on wheels. Um, we've got a uh, number one here. Uh, this is basically the, chain, the, the, the window into the chamber, this uh, chamber door here. Uh, there's <clears throat> a, a lockout system, so you, it, it's almost virtually impossible to open this during the operation. Um, the lower door two here, underneath here, uh, is the Z drive, where the power, uh, which drives the, um, uh, the, the base plate down. Big emergency stop button on the, on the right there, red. There's an operator touch screen, which uh, allows you to choose the file which you've downloaded onto the machine to run. Um, all the electrics are housed on the right hand side of the machine there. There's a computer inside there and a big um, set of boards with motherboards in there. Uh, so there's control for the laser. Uh, the laser itself is at the top, runs along the top. It's aligned horizontally with um, gal galvanometer uh, mirrors at the top, which take the which reflect at a 90 degree angle the the laser beam down it, through a focusing lens, which we'll see later on, onto the base plate. Um, there's all safety locking mechanisms. What you can't see is at the top on the back side here is the hopper, which we'll see later in some more photographs. Um, so that's the basic layout of the machine. So if we simplify the working parts. Um, what we have is a hopper, which delivers powder, um, that would be A, uh, which is actually located just um, behind the laser here. Um, we've got a wiper, which pulls over the bed, so the powder comes down, deposits the front, the powder um, takes it over. There's a build plate, D, here, which drops down after each layer. This is on a motorized Z system and it lowers the base plate um, somewhere between uh, in preset intervals of 20 to uh, 80 micron, uh, typically 50 micron. That gives us a powder bath volume, which is C, um, of about um, 50 micron deep uh, by 250 by 250. 
There's the laser system above with the um, galvanometer mirror um, scanner there, which can move the laser back and forth across the plate. And this is focused through the, uh, what they call the F theta lens just on the roof. So the procedure for setting up a build is that every time we need to have a build, we have to put a new build plate in. So we bolt it in onto the dead stage. The chamber is then evacuated and backfilled with 10 millibar of argon. And we'll keep on doing those steps one to three until there's an oxygen sensor which reads less than 100 ppm. Okay, and at that point, then the argon is recirculated through the system uh, pump. The plate drops through the first layer thickness, 50 microns, and then at each layer, the powder is deposited from the hopper, deposited in front of the wiper. The wiper moves across the build plate, filling up the bath. The wiper stops at the front of the build plate, pushing any excess powder down the spill chute at the front and collected for reuse. The laser then fired across the build plate over the 250 mil square area onto the powder, melting the powder in individual tracks. Um, and the laser is focused through the theta lens and the small and small movements of the mirror give it relatively large area of application. So once the area, once the laser has covered the entire area, the laser stops firing, and the build plate drops for another machine layer thickness on top, and the wiper returns to just in front of the hopper pile, and then the powder comes down, and then the, that sequence is repeated for each layer. So once all of these has gone through, however many layers you've got, 3,000, 5,000, 6,000, whatever, however long it is, um, and the component is finished, it's enveloped in powder, and it's buried in the powder bath. So you can then put your hands in the glove and slowly raise the, um, the, uh, the base plate up, the powder tumbles off, and then with a brush, you can brush off the excess powder and put it down the chute for reuse. So at that point then, uh, when you've cleaned down as much as you can um, and got as much powder off the system as possible, um, you will close off and isolate the, the hopper powder, you know, the valves with the um, overflow powders, and then the front door can be uh, opened to remove the plate. And at that point, you would start the clean down sequence where you would get the hoover in and clean up all the excess powder which has been left around the, uh, in the chamber. Basically, the, the reusing the powder is absolutely essential. It's not just a, a nice thing to have environmentally, but the more you reuse the powder, the cheaper it is. The powder isn't particularly cheap. And if you were to have to use the entire, if you were not able to use the entire um, batch of powder, you were wasting, uh, for every component you make, you'd be wasting uh, almost 90% uh, uh, of powder. So it has to be reused, and that's the good thing about this. Um, but unfortunately, that means that uh, you can't directly reuse the powder that's left over. You have to sieve it and you have to cut out. So during the, uh, the lasering process, larger particles are added to the, um, uh, they, they come off from the sparks um, and um, uh, condensate, which comes at the level of each laser when it's fired. And, and those spatter sparks and um, sort of nanoparticles end up in the main uh, bunch of powder which then needs to be sieved, cut them out, and return the powder sizes to what can be used. But unfortunately, the sieving is quite manually intensive and time consuming. Um, and uh, sometimes you need to do it if you've got low levels of powder in the back hopper, uh, which will only give you a certain height, depending on the density of the powder. You may have this potential of uh, doing uh, only 20 uh, millimeters, but if you keep on sieving during the process, you can uh, keep, make sure you can get a higher build. Um, but that could take us, it takes a lot of uh, effort. So uh, this is uh, where the REN 500 comes in, which you've got this in the, um, in the labs at Swansea. And uh, hopefully th sometime in the next couple of weeks, you will be having a chance to uh, see the new machine. Uh, this has got a, an automated powder sieving system, and this reduces the, uh, the, the amount of sieving work required. So basically we have two uh, main loops, we have a gas flow loop uh, and a powder flow loop. Okay, so um, I have this, uh, the, the, I've described the two processes, how they uh, are linked to each other. Um, um, but during the process, uh, you've got the gas loop, which is entirely internal to the system. And at the moment with the REN, with, with this REN 250, which I'm describing here, uh, and the REN 400, the powder fluid is, is external. So after it comes down from the hopper deposit at the front, it comes down through overshoot um, outlets in front of the hot plate. This goes into powder canisters, that gets received, and then it goes back into the main hopper at the back of the machine. That's the powder flow loop. And then inside the machine, we have a fan, 
and filters so that when the gas comes through, um, it, it'll go through the filters, an outlet that will capture any particulates which are, have become airborne or gasborne within the system, and then the pump takes it back around the system. Um, this is all monitored. So at this point here, we've got monitors which monitor the level of oxygen, the temperature, uh, humidity, all within the gas flow loop. Um, so you can see inside the chamber here, this has actually got a calibration uh, unit inside. But you can see on the right hand side there, indicated by the red arrow, you've got a series of uh, small inlets where the argon comes into the system and you've got a big outlet on the left hand side where the gas leaves the system. Okay, and at the back, indicated by the blue arrows, we've got the, the funnel from the hopper, which comes down in front of the wiper. That deposits it's a layer of powder on the front, which is then scraped across the powder bed which is there on top of this plate. And then any excess powder goes through the uh, front chute here at the, um, at the front. And there's another hole at the back and those two lead through to uh, collection flasks. So looking at the back of the machine, you can see the location of the hopper. It's quite a large hopper. It will store anything from 30 to 60 kilos, but that does depend on what powder alloy you're using. Um, and you've got a sensor on the top of the uh, hopper here, which uh, indicates uh, to a certain extent how much powder is left within the hopper. The wiper itself at the front, uh, at the back of the machine is relatively simple, but incredibly important in terms of the quality of the build. Um, so you've got this um, small steel contraption, which traps a wiper down the middle, these little small bolts. Um, and it's, it's very important to get the height uh, of this right, and it needs to be changed after every build. There you can see the damage of some of the builds where, uh, which have gone wrong, which have um, gone above the powder bed height and actually started to scratch. The wiper can be, um, can be wrecked during the build um, if, there are, uh, if the build itself has started to fail uh, for any reason. And that can lead then, if the wiper is damaged, subsequent layers will not be able to deposit powder properly, so there won't be a, there'll be an incomplete fill. So it's very important, obviously, to change the wiper, uh, change the, uh, the rubber um, uh, blade uh, after every build and make sure that it's uh, properly located. Um, the build plate itself is 250 square millimeters and it's got four uh, M10 bolt holes. Typically, we will try to build, if we have uh, sufficient um, space on the build plate, within uh, the the area uh, outside. So if the, if this is the back of the uh, hopper on the top of the page, and the wipe, wiper comes from the top to the bottom, then we will try to locate ourselves so we're not uh, within the shadow of where the two holes are to avoid any uh, problems with the holes. So effectively, it gives a slightly smaller build area, but if needs be, we can, but we cannot guarantee the quality um, at that point. Now the laser system, so the Renish AM250, which was the old system we had, uh, has a 200 watt uh, Ethereum fiber laser, which has a wavelength of 1,070 nanometers, or just over one micron. And laser scan speeds on this machine were typically up to about 1,000 millimeters per second. You could do higher laser scan speeds, but that didn't necessarily guarantee you very good density. Uh, the laser beam. Uh, is collimated to minimum nominal powder bed spot size of 70 microns. So the diameter of the laser beam at the point of the um, where it's fusing the powder on the base plate is 70 microns. Yeah. Um, it, this laser is cooled at all times by one kilowatt chiller, and it has to keep the temperature of the laser at plus or minus one degrees at all times. So the chiller is pretty much run consistently, continually the whole time. There's a, uh, so the laser is uh, located on top of the machine uh, horizontally, and this goes to scanning mirrors, which through small deflections uh, here, allow you to move the uh, laser across the entire bed area. There's a focusing lens, uh, which is an F theta focusing lens, which uh, gives you a um, conical um, convergence of the of the laser down to its narrowest diameter point of 70 microns at the um, height of the base plate. So why do we use an inert gas like argon in the system? Well, because 
Uh, it carries away condensate, it's one of the uh, functions of the gas. So uh, when the uh, powder is melted, there is a some level of evaporation of, uh, of the alloy, uh, which, can, which condenses in the, in the gas, and that needs to be carried away, and also uh, to, to keep it away from the melt pool. Um, the inert gas itself stops the, uh, basically stops this from being a pyrophobic, uh, the, from the powder from exploding. Um, it also stops it from oxidizing. So the cover, it's like, it acts like a cover gas in welding, exactly the same thing. It stops it from, from oxidizing. Um, it gives the powder a longer life. Uh, it also stops oxidized forming at the melt pool, uh, which uh, guarantees that um, when it solidifies, we have a metal and not an oxide. Um, so we use uh, fixed gas canisters. Um, it typically uses between 30 and 50 liters per hour build. Um, there, that gives us about 20 builds per cylinder. So there's 4,000 liters per cylinder. Um, so it's about 200 liters per build on average, depending on the number of hours. Uh, it does have to be uh, above a certain pressure before we can no longer use it. And it also has to, we use very high quality 99.9%. Um, that means that the oxygen levels are low. Um, prefer, depending on the metals which you use in there, so if you've got highly reactive metals uh, like titanium and aluminium, it's very important to keep the oxygen levels low, as low as possible. Oxides that form at the level of the melt pool can be very detrimental, particularly in the reactive metals. Um, so just to put this in context, um, the gas itself uh, will come through um, with 4 ppm. Uh, potentially the, the powder, if you measure the oxygen levels in the powder, you can have levels of up to, in titanium, you could start with 1300, 1400, which is the low oxygen. Uh, as each build com continues, you tend to pick up somewhere between 50 and 200 parts per million. So that means that after about maybe um, 30 iterations uh, of using the powder with titanium, you're looking at a buildup of about 1000 parts per million. Uh, to put that in the context of the mechanical properties of titanium parts, if you were to use uh, in a low turbine engine, titanium alloys going into the low, low turbine stage of a, of a jet engine, cast alloys are not allowed to have more than 500 parts per million. And yet we're starting with an oxygen level in titanium parts, which are over 1,300 already. So uh, uh, oxygen is very important and we need to keep it out of the process in order to minimize it uh, for something that we know is already potentially very high coming through from the powder levels themselves. So um, what you can see here is on the left-hand side of the machine, we've opened it up so you can see here uh, the outlet side. You've got um, the gas flow loop outlet, um, and this comes through uh, filters, which need to be changed as well at the end of every build. Inside this mechanical canister, there are disposable plastic filters. These filters catch out the um, particulates, very small particulates in the gas. Um, and then once the filters have captured the gas, it comes back through this loop here into this fan and it sends it back into the system. And just above it, you can see the oxygen sensors. To the right, so these rather green looking tubes, um, and to the right and to the left, this is where the overflow at the front, which has got a five kilo collection flask at the bottom, and on the left-hand side, although it hasn't got the flask attached, uh, there's also a smaller two and a half kilo collection bulb, uh, flask. Um, meant to be a picture here, I'm not sure why it's missing. Um, I think we were going to talk about the, the, the powder. Uh, those powder flasks get taken over to the um, sieve. They can be done because of the interlock system that's there. They can be isolated. They can be attached to uh, the sieve system. Here's the sieve itself. So you can see a flask attached to the top. Because of the interlock system here, this means that the at all points the gas is always isolated under arc. Um, so uh, when you attach a flask to the top with the uh, used powder, uh, uh, with the the contaminant with, with the oversized particles, which you're going to sieve, uh, you attach another flask to the other end. When you open the the two um, the locking system. 
that allows the gas to come through and it, the gas goes through into the bottom system here while the powder goes through the sieve and is then collected into here. So at all points, the gas is isolated. The mesh size on this uh, sieve system here is a 63 micron mesh. That means that all particles above 63 micron are cut out. And that ensures that the powder size distribution that comes into the uh, sieved powder at the bottom here is, is for use um, in the, um, can go back into the main hopper. There has been, uh, over the last couple of years, quite a lot of interest in what happens to powders as they get um, used uh, repeatedly. Uh, we've undertaken some studies, uh, but also uh, other universities. I've um, not put in the uh, reference here, but I've, I'll try to do that later on. So uh, this is not our work. This is some work on TR64. They suggested that there was a rather large change after even 12 cycles. There was a large change in the powder size distribution. They're going from what would be a finer size distribution, this is a cumulative size fraction. Um, here, uh, they show that after six and 12 cycles, they, 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 they demonstrate that potentially there was a, an increase that the powder was coarsening. And that coarsening of powders would potentially mean that there were some larger powders coming through, a lot of larger size. So that would potentially really jeopardize the process if you've got uh, 100 micron or 200 micron size powders not necessarily melting well, they will jeopardize your, uh, your build. However, uh, we don't agree with this study. I just thought I would show these results as part of the interest that goes into uh, the research re reverting of powder. The powder size distributions are important from the quality, for the um, uh, perspective of the quality of the build, and that's something we're going to talk about uh, in uh, during the powder manufacturing chapter uh, later on in this in this module. I mentioned before uh, how the, the handling of the powder is obviously very important. We uh, we have uh, lots of health and safety issues with uh, that we have to and um, operating procedures, ma masks, gloves, eye protection, and these masks are uh, of a very specific standard uh, to make sure that they fit the operator well. Um, all powders should be handled carefully, but in particular, reactive powders like titanium and aluminium um, should be um, handled and kept at all times uh, within argon. Um, these powder flasks are supplied to this butterfly valve system, uh, or interlock system, which means that the gas, the powder is kept at all points under argon. So I've mentioned some of the powder safety uh, handling uh, already. We have the, the, the vacuum cleaners that we use for cleaning out the uh, system are also specialist ATEX rated industrial vacuum cleaners. Uh, and, and this is actually a point of, uh, of a lot of care has been taken in choosing the right system. Uh, and when we do the tour, I'll show you an example of that. An older industrial vacuum system, which was uh, not as highly rated as the, a newer one. Here are some details. If you're interested, you can download the presentation later. Um, I think I've mentioned most of these already in, in, in this presentation. Uh, more data, nothing specifically here that uh, uh, I haven't mentioned already. So uh, most of that operating process with the sort of mechanical side of the operating of the operation, uh, and always assuming that you have prepared your build file. Uh, we'll talk more about the preparation of build files, build file during the design for AM chapter in this module. Uh, but once you do have a, a file, MTT file, it gets transferred over by um, uh, an IP protocol, um, and it, you can have up to ten different uh, files located in the system. These files are a sliced version, they're called the MTT file, they're a sliced version of your STL with support structures added, uh, and there can be up to 10 different files stored on the system at any one time. It allows you, this, this in user interface um, is once you've bolted the plate down and shut it and all the system's prepped and ready to go, you need to do some calibration, uh, align the base plate, um, and uh, set some of the, some operating procedures are set within the uh, TLC touchscreen. Uh, this is the older, uh, older version for the SLM250. This goes back quite a way. Just shows you some of the sort of uh, menu sides. Uh, you do have access to a lot of the operating procedures, but what they have is a series of um, operator user levels uh, to make sure that these parameters uh, are only accessed by operators who know what they're doing. Um, so 
uh, as part of the um, uh, agreement for Swansea to be able to access all the parameters of the machine, we have the top level clearance to be able to access all parameters. But it is possible for the machine to be set up so that it only, only a number of these parameters can be changed by the operator. That would be sort of one of the lower level clearances. Uh, here's a picture of the back. Uh, it's uh, uh, of the right hand side with all the electrics. So literally there is a PC, you can see it down there, sitting inside there, but then you've also got all the boards which control the laser. Um, we've seen already the inside of the chamber, the all the different parts, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much. There's an image of the Z stage underneath that drops down. Uh, there you can just see the uh, one of the front overshoot, uh, which uh, takes the powder down to the overflow flask. Um, We've been through a lot of this already. Uh, the powder handling, some more images of the machine. And there's the base plate. One thing I should mention is the base plate itself. Here on the AM250, uh, the base plate can be heated up to 140 degrees. Uh, with the uh, REN400 and uh, the REN AM500, this will go, has gone up to 170 degrees. So there is some evidence that having the base plate heated uh, reduces the residual stresses which are in the material. Uh, it also primes the powder slightly, ready for our use. So, but yeah, the jury's out. We tend to work with most of our plates uh, as heated. There's the picture of the base plate, the powder hopper, um, the laser, some more images of the laser, focusing lens. Uh, you can see here one of the unenviable jobs of the operator is to clean down the uh, so preferably after every build. So that condensate I was talking about in terms of the melt pool, where you have evaporated material coming up in the gas, if uh, you run the machine for long enough, you find that there's a buildup, a very fine, almost invisible, almost invisible, you can just about see it on the lens, um, buildup of nanoparticulate powder on the lens. And this needs to be cleaned at every, uh, after every build. And it's a very thorough cleaning process. It takes quite a bit of time. This theta lens here is almost, um, two inches, two and a half inches thick glass, uh, very expensive to replace if you drop it, and you, carry, you carry it over to the cleaning table uh, very carefully. And then it's uh, with a mixture of IPA and special cleaning cloths. Uh, if you were to say much as Lee's a, a, a greasy thumbprint on the screen, that itself would be reflected and magnified in problems. So you would actually see that thumbprint printed within the metal. So that needs to that lens needs to be kept immaculate, and this is one of the problems that um, uh, faced the machine manufacturers: is how to make sure that the focusing lens was kept clean at all times during long builds, 60-hour builds. Uh, there is just the chiller, a one kilowatt chiller sitting on the side, to make sure the laser is kept cool at all times. Uh, one of the pictures of the gas bottles, purity of the gas bottles. We've seen a lot of these slides already, so. Um, Really, it's just more detailed numbering system there. Uh, so here you see uh, a picture of kind of before and after. This is during operation. You can see the the, the, the small flask attached on the left hand side of the uh, of the gas flow, and the locking system is down, which means the gas the the, the powder can flow through and fill up the canister. So a lot of work is going into here at Swansea. We're doing a lot of work in the simulation of the gas flow through the chamber. We're trying to make sure, ideally, you want to have as low a flow of gas over the top surface, not to dissect, to uh, not to um, affect the uh, the powder which is lying on the surface, not to move that. Uh, but also, you need to have a high enough one that it can whip away uh, the unwanted condensate plumes and molten. Uh, ejaculate and uh, spatter material which comes off and also make sure you have a good even cover across it. So here we've been through lots of different designs of nozzles. We'll talk more about the simulation aspects which uh, we're using of the process in a later chapter. Uh, but so here's the sequence of removing a filter. You can see that is the filter there that connects the small particles that are in the gas. Um, so these are the flasks that go to the uh, sieving machine. I'm literally running through these quite quickly now because we've I've talked a lot about this throughout the whole of the presentation. So uh, some of this is a bit repetitive. Metal powder safety, 
metal powder handling. Um, okay, so I've talked a lot about this. There's some more pictures of the old machine. Okay, there's the industrial ATEX rated old Hoover that um, we had. It's a big towering machine. Uh, this has now been updated. Uh, there were some issues about uh, the uh, making sure that there was no sparks and that it was all controlled. The earthing was, you need to make sure there's no sparks when you're around powder, that could lead to explosions. Um, so I'm just gonna jump through the rest of these slides. There's nothing much that I haven't covered already. Um, you can see here part of what we're gonna talk about in the later chapter as well, which is the actual uh, file, which is mounted on the plate, which comes out of, this is actually from the Autofab software system, which slices up the, soft, slices up the, uh, the CAD files. Um, and this is where you would control uh, how the laser um, runs across it. There is, uh, on the power consumption, you can see, for example, here, uh, the one kilowatt. Uh, so this is uh, over really hours of build. You can see that um, you've got almost two kilowatts being drawn uh, the entire uh, time of the build. And then when the build finishes, what's left is that you've got the continual use of power by the chiller, keeping the system uh, cool. Um, if you actually look at the power uses itself, you can actually sort of uh, see uh, the points when the laser isn't firing. Uh, so each of these are the intervals through which the, the wiper is coming over. And then each of this, uh, these, power, these power profiles correspond very closely to the amount of coverage that you've got at any point during the build. So we have actually got the, uh, some bills which have been used for monitoring the power usage. Uh, and again, you can see this interval uh, as uh, you go through, the wipe comes through, no power is being used, and then the, fire, uh, the laser fires, and then for the next layer, wipe comes through, etc. Okay, so that pretty much covers, this, is, this has been very um, sort of operating, uh, I, I, I call showing you the, the mechanism for a powder bed system, which is very representative of powder bed systems, the AM250, uh, showing you from a very mechanistic kind of how it works perspective. Um, uh, this I thought might be useful. Uh, it is representative of the REN400 and the REN500 um, in terms of some of the operating procedures. Uh, we're going to know more about the sort of in more in depth about how the uh, uh, the laser fuses the material in the next um, set of lectures. Um, but this will give you some insight now for your projects to give you a bit more idea of how your components are going to be built and what machine they're going to be built. Um, and so I'll have a few quick questions uh, on, on this in test form. Okay, all the best.